Hi everyone. I am just doing a quick introduction here. Uh, if you've watched my latest Disney Villains retrospective video, you'll know that I interviewed one of the animators for Fox and the Hound, Cherry Rees, and it was really wonderful to talk to him. It was really nice of him to do this. And the reason that I'm recording an introduction right now is because, well, I wasn't really sure how much of the interview I was going to use. I wasn't sure if I should uh, just put the whole thing up at a separate video or what. So, and this was also my first time doing something like this. So I'll admit I was a little nervous. So we just kind of started talking. So because we didn't really record a proper introduction, I thought I would record one here before I shared that interview. I am going to link to Jerry's website here as well because he's done a lot of really cool stuff and it's definitely worth a look. So now without further ado, here is our interview about the Fox and the Hound. Um, I know that that is a, a really interesting movie historically because there's a lot of changes that were going on and a lot of things that kind of slowed down production, a lot of, uh, sounds like some conflicts behind the scenes. And it's not really something that gets discussed much uh, right. that I see in official documents. And I, I kind of understand why, but it's a very interesting story. And I know that this also affected how the character of Amos Slade and also how uh, Chief were treated in the movie. And it affected a lot of the plot. What was the attitude that, did, that was uh, at the studios? It, it seemed like there was or the, the animators coming in wanted to do something that was akin to the classics, but also something new, sort of a sort of balance. But there was higher ups, there seemed to be more of a risk aversion. Yeah, it, well, it, it's interesting because one would think it was that the younger versus the older generation. And that wasn't really the case. The, the actually allied in wanting to do something new and classic and bold were the veterans and the youngest people coming in. So people like Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson and Eric Larson and Milt Call and Ward Kimball and uh, Mark Davis, like that whole group were absolutely committed to full out dynamic, emotional storytelling, uh, cinematic storytelling, all of that. So. As the younger generation came in and we were being stimulated by the unveiling of Star Wars, the, you know, the first Star Wars had happened and it was a disruptive force in the industry in a good way and reminded us of the disruption that Walt Disney and his team had created in the Snow White days where it, there was a sudden change of the, the whole creative approach to storytelling for cinema when animation stepped up and really made this bold cinematic emotional statement with Snow White. And we felt like Star Wars was doing that same sort of dynamic push forward. And we wanted to do that same kind of dynamic contemporary and classic push forward akin to the Star Wars inspiration we were getting in the world of animation. And we saw it as a time to make that jump to like the next uh, the next Snow White impact with our generation and the veterans wanted that too and were encouraging us to be as bold and as innovative as possible. They, they were cheering us on. So you had the most veteran people, the, the, you know, the, the remnants of, of Walt's nine old men team and all of us young people coming in completely on the same page with that. In the middle, you had uh, the management at the time that was now in control of content. So the veterans were no longer in control of content and us coming in as the newbies were not in control of content. So uh, you may have heard me mention in previous interviews that Brad Bird and I had seen this happening to the veterans when we were college students, we Brad and I went in to visit Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. Well, actually we went in to visit, uh, we ran into them. We were actually there to visit Eric Larson and Milk Call. And Frank and Ollie saw us in the hallway and said, hey, you wanna, you wanna come see something? And of course, Brad and I said, yes. And we ran down to their room and they had a story reel of a sequence from the Rescuers. This was back when they were still making the original Rescuers film. And so Frank and Ollie wanted Brad and me to see what they were up to. 
and they took us over to the moviola and they turned the lights down in the room and they played this sequence for us and it was all pencil test but with full you know sound and uh and full full animation but in pencil test form and it was penny when she was down in the caverns uh and the seawater was rushing into the cave and uh she uh, and medusa is coaxing her on from above and there was a dramatic moment where Penny was caught in the seawater and pulled down underwater out of the scene. And she was just gone and the water was there churning and she was gone and she was gone. And we were just waiting there and it was getting so dramatic. And then suddenly bah, she burst up out of the water and was gasping for breath. And, you know, Brad and I both had pounding hearts and we we're watching this scene unfold. and. You know, Frank and Ollie were watching proudly from the sidelines because they, you know, they wanted us to to see how dramatic they had made it. And they were living up to all those standards of full emotional, dramatic storytelling from the classic days in that era. So, uh, you know, they weren't showing the age of the studio or their age or, you know, any sort of waning of, of the uh, the passion for it. it. Quite the opposite. It was it was full out. So the scene finished and brad and i gave them applause and told them well done and they said well you're the last two people that are going to see it because Wooly wants us to cut it and uh make it much less dramatic and they say he said it's too scary and we were going too scary what are you talking about you you guys did the, like pinocchio drowns he's like face down in the ocean water in the sand and and uh you know snow white oh my god it's like too scary don't they know your own legacy is filled with this kind of drama and they said oh you know you're talking to the choir go go tell that to woolly and we said we will and so they they immediately picked up the phone and they called woolly reitherman's office and they said uh brad and jerry would like to come up and we were just still college punks at that point but woolly invited us up and uh we sat there and we we told him like Frank and Ollie made an amazing sequence. Oh my God, we just saw it. And we were pleading the case of like, look at your own legacy. Oh my God, why don't you want this? And he was nice enough, but kind of patronizing. And he said, oh, you know, we get letters from the Bible Belt and stuff. So he he was, uh, but he mainly tried to joke his way out of it and just kind of be, uh, you know, humorous. He said, uh, he was like, you know, back in our day, we, you know, I had, we had to, make our own paper by like splitting logs and drilling the holes for pigs and stuff. You know, he was just being goofing off. But Brad and I were just so frustrated. And that was even before we had stepped in to start work. We were still in college and we were looking at our heroes at the studio, still completely committed to the passion they always had and the cinema and the drama and the emotion that they always had. And they were being censored at the studio. Now, now, you know, Wooly was participating in that. He was one of Walt's nine old men, but there was, uh, you know, uh, Ron Miller was uh, running the place, well, you know, Walt's uh, son-in-law and, and they had a bunch of other people there that they were answering to in terms of, you know, the business end of things and all of that. And we thought, well, how are we going to have a chance if our heroes, the veterans, they, they've earned the right to have a voice in the cinema and they're being censored right now. So as we step in to the studio, we're going to do our best, but they're being censored. How are we going to survive? So when we went in, you know, um, the, you know, Star Wars happened. We were excited by that. That re rejuvenated our, our passion to make it work anyway, to somehow push through. And um, on the Fox and the Hound, so, the, you know, I had some history before that. I went in on the end of Pete's Dragon during the crunch and then animated on the small one. Uh, you know, uh, featurette, and then and then was in the Fox and the Hound. But by the time I got in the Fox and the Hound, so I took a shot at this at what Frank and Ollie tried to do and put together a sequence. And I, I actually was given permission from Art Stevens and Ted Berman, who were co-directing, uh, to put together a little uh, group of people and sequence direct something as a proposal for how the film would open. So I remember. Uh, Gerald Van Sitters was working with me, and I'm trying to remember whether it was, I think Musker participated. I'm not sure if Brad was participating in that one or not. I forget the full group, but it was um, a team of like three or four of us. And it was a proposal for how the film would open, having to do with the 
you know, the, the mother fox is leaving the baby, uh, as you've seen in the film where it's, you know, that you hear the hunting dogs uh, approaching and she leaves the baby fox and then runs off. Well, I took that further so that you actually, when she left the baby, you followed her as she's leading the dogs uh, away from it. And I had a scene where you're at a, um, the edge of a meadow and there's the, the forest and she comes to the edge of the meadow and sees the opening where she's going to be exposed now and realizes if I'm going to keep guiding them away from my baby, I have to take a chance and run out here across the, the open space. So she darts out through the meadow, out into the open, from going from the cover of the forest out into the open, and the camera is pulling back in front of her. So as she's running, you're in front of her and you're pulling backwards as she's running forward. So she, her face is aimed at you and she's trying to keep up. And it, you know the camera is pulling back, back, back across the meadow and she's running towards you. And as she runs towards you, she goes out of you with a, a dip in the, in the ground and goes out of you and then comes up into view over the horizon of the next little hill in the, in the meadow. And when she goes out of sight, the next time she comes up, she's a little closer and you realize, oh, she's making progress. She's making progress. She does up another one. Oh, she's getting closer. She's going to escape with us. And then there's a gunshot when she's out of sight and you keep pulling back and you expect the same rhythm that's been happening where she comes into view over the next horizon. This time she doesn't come into view over the horizon. The camera keeps pulling back and she's just not with us anymore. And the camera finally gives up and slows down and stops. And it's just uh, the meadow and no sight of her. She's, you know, she went out of sight and the, the shot rang out at that point. So you don't see her taken away, but you know that she's died. And um, it had that feeling of, uh, in a way of in Bambi, when you realize as, as Bambi races back for cover and then is hoping his mom made it and you realize she didn't make it. And there's that, that powerful emotion where you, you, in Bambi, the story wasn't like, oh, they got lost from each other. <laughs> it was like, no, his mother died. And that was the same story here. It was about an orphan fox baby. It was not about a baby that got separated from its mom. So in order to fully state that, that in the same way Bambi lost his mother, this baby fox lost its mother. And to do it with a dramatic cinema shot that felt like it was new, new storytelling. And we were, you know, inspired by people like Spielberg and Lucas and Coppola and like trying to do it in a very cinematic, bold way that would be very memorable as filmmaking. But to do it in a, a, a an emotional way so you you felt like she was gaining ground and gaining ground and almost made it and not quite and to feel the swell of hope and then the agony of of her not making it and then you know your storytelling as you're committed now to the the life of this baby that's lost its mother like what's going to happen to it and and it sort of immediately increases your investment in caring about that character so um we had that moment where we showed it to Art and Ted in pencil test form, and it reminded me of the moment that Frank and Ollie had when they put the film on the Moviola and had Brad, asked Brad and me to watch. Now here we were putting it on the Moviola and inviting Art and Ted to watch. And the scene played out, and it got to that point where the camera stopped and just a couple of birds flew off and it got very quiet. And they turned from the Moviola and they looked at me and went, well, she's dead. And I went, Yes, that's the story. And they went, no, 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 you, you have to leave it like maybe people think she got away or whatever. And I said, really? Are we telling the story of a, a baby fox whose mom was afraid and, and left it? Or I thought it was about an orphan. I mean, in the story, it's an, it's an orphan. So they're like, no, we have to leave. Maybe she got away as the story beat. And so it's like, oh, my God. It's like, you know, Frank and Ollie were shot down when they tried to do the full out emotion. So of course I would be with my sequence and, and my team that was working with me. So, but we, you know, we gave it a valiant shot and the, you know, the irony is we still had people like Eric Larson rooting for us and hoping that we could make the difference and hoping we could turn it around. Uh, so, so anyway, it was a, it was a very frustrating time, but, but I really want people to remember that the most veteran animators 
were in sync with us as the young filmmakers coming in. Uh, yes, they always rooted for us. And uh, Frank and Ollie came to the, you know, to see the Brave Little Toaster at a screening. And, uh, and they just were always cheering us on and, and hoping we could do well. And when I did leave the studio and was my first effort was working with Brad Bird and Gary Kurtz, and we were trying to get Will Eisner's The Spirit off the ground as an animated feature. You know, I had my sad goodbye with Eric Larson, letting him know that I was having to leave, but he fully understood that. And he had, in the meantime, been trying to help me get some traction at the studio to change things. And when that wasn't happening, he understood that the reason we were leaving is not because we were tired of Disney. We were trying to keep the Disney flame alive, the same flame that the veterans wanted to keep alive. We were trying to protect the same thing, but we just felt like we can't do it in these walls right now. It's being snuffed out when you do it. And when we do it, it's being snuffed out. So Gary Kurtz seems to understand it and want to protect that flame and keep it alive. And frankly, when Lasseter found a foothold uh, with Pixar, we felt the same thing. Like that he and his group were keeping the Disney flame alive. They weren't competing with Disney or trying to, you know, show them up or whatever. They were trying to keep the same filmmaking, storytelling, character as king and story, character and emotion, emotion driving technology. Uh, that was, they were keeping the Disney flame alive at Pixar. We were trying to do that earlier in setting up with Gary Kurtz outside of Disney uh, to protect the Disney flame, you know. Uh, so the veterans understood that. And actually it was, it was the cutest thing, Colin, that Eric had helped me give a presentation about animating the birds. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard stories about the, the sort of hiding we had to do with the, with the bird characters. Are you familiar with that? Well, I know that you developed, I've heard you talk about how you developed a technique on animating them. And I noticed that Dinky especially, but I mean, the movement on him is really impressive, but what, what is the hiding that you mean? Well, uh, as soon as I did that, where, you know, I was trying to, trying to follow the advice of the veterans who were saying, don't always just look at something from the arch animation archives, because when we were animating, we were looking at life. So we're flattered that you like to look at our work, but don't just copy our work. Look around you and look at life and draw thing, new things in that we haven't thought of yet into your work. Uh, so, you know, I was observing birds. I knew that birds were, you know, some of the characters we'd be dealing with in The Fox and the Hound. And as I got started, I was out at, at the commissary uh, and little sparrows and jays and things would come around to, to actually were very bold. They would jump up on the table and like steal food off our plate. And, uh, but I was just looking at those little birds and they would be moving around and doing several poses per second. And, you know, that's something that is not typically taught in animation, especially in feature animation, where you're taught to be very clear and deliberate about things. And the idea of doing, you know, several poses in one second, and then to continue with that kind of, of activity was just something you were avoiding, like that's going against the principles. But I went, gee, a real bird is doing it and it's not confusing my mind. I can easily tell what it's doing. There has to be a way to distill a portion of that into animation. So I did the first several tests where I was trying that out with, uh, I was doing a combination of things like when it would turn its head, for example, I would have a slight slow out frame and then a stretch frame where it was like a blur. And then it would be almost entirely at its destination and then a, like a one frame slow in. So when you looked at the drawings, it was it was suddenly very misshapen and then it would reshape itself. And I had little principles like when it would hop, I would have the uh, the tail flick and I would have uh, when it was about to take off, just leaning forward slightly and then become a, a, a column of color with like 12 wings and then it would be gone. Things like that where it was capturing some of that feeling of the absolute vitality and quickness of those little birds. and. Art and Ted saw a pencil test of that. I took it to them and said, well, what do you think about this? And, you know, Brad and and John Musker and different people were seeing what I was doing and they dug it. They were like, oh, that's cool. And 
so we were all crossing our fingers with Art and Ted, and we knew that they, you know, they didn't always approve stuff we were excited about. So they they looked at my animation on the screen, and they they really were delighted by it. And in fact, an NBC producer sent in 2021, I believe it was, recently, uh, NBC producer had been in, had been in touch with me to interview me about some things. He sent me an article that Ted Berman wrote a decade after the Fox and the Hound, and that. I had never seen this, but he sent me the article and Ted a decade later mentioned that at Disney, there was an, a, a sort of an approved method for animating birds from Snow White on. And then on the Fox and the Hound, this guy named Jerry Reese came up with a delightful new way to do it. And boy, it was charming. And so he, he committed to print in this article praise of what I was doing, right? Well, go back to that first moment. They're watching it on film. They're delighted. Uh, then they ask to look at my drawings. So I show them my drawings and they go, oh no, you can't do that. That's too cartoony to be in a feature. No, no, you can't do that. So here I am with a puzzle. It's like they liked the result when it was at 24 frames a second, which is how the audience is gonna see it. But when they saw how I did it frame by frame, they said, no, you can't put that in our film. So. I had to start a pattern then where I kept animating the way I needed to. And when I had to have the drawings looked at, the two people assisting me, uh, Rebecca and Sue, they were doing the cleanup animation. They would hide all the offensive drawings. They would take them out of the scene and put them away and then take it to be approved. And they would flip through and see like part of the drawings, but not all of the drawings. And it would get approved and then they would reinsert them and send it through ink and paint and camera. And so for the whole movie, we had to fool the two directors about what we were even animating. And they kept loving what they were seeing on the, on the screen. But anytime they had to look at the drawings, they said no. So, so I learned never to show them the true drawing pet stack. Uh, so, Eric Larson was aware of this. I shared this with him and he was, he loved the fact that A, I was trying to discover new things. So, uh, you know, I was listening to him as he was my teacher. And then he loved the fact that I had found a way to sneak in the quality work. It's like, you know, the, I wasn't putting things in that the directors didn't like. They were charmed by it. They wrote articles about it a decade later that they loved my work. It's just that I had to sneak it past their rules in order to get it on the screen. As soon as it was on the screen, they were charmed by it. But I could not have done that animation if I had had to get every scene approved. They just would say no, and it would be something else. You'd be watching different animation than you're seeing now if I had gotten it approved. So Eric saw that. He realized that I was doing that. He thought it was clever that we had come up with a way to go behind their backs. And he thought that was the coolest thing. So he wasn't offended at all. He thought that was great. So he asked me to give a, a presentation to my peers about that principle of animation and, and about sort of boldly doing things anyway. And so Eric arranged for, a, they called it a sweat box in those days. It was a screening room. Uh, and it was a special room that was able to show a frame at a time with film without burning it. You know, it's it's not like video or digital now where you can just pause on a frame. If you try to do that on film in a projector, it just burns. Well, it had a sort of a, a dowser thing that would come down and get, so it would dim the image, not be full brightness, but it would protect it from the heat enough so that you could pause for a few seconds on a frame without, without burning the, the film itself. And so he had me, uh, give a presentation about my approach and he sat in the back so and it was he just had this little mannerism that we were all used to that he had keys in his pocket and he'd walk in and you'd, you'd hear him like he would just he had deep pockets and he would just sort of jingle his keys in his pocket uh, as just a little little mannerism and so you'd hear it it was almost like wind chimes you'd hear a little jingle jingle and you'd know like oh eric's eric's coming and uh he would just do that when he was uh, passing the time and, and just sort of hanging out and he would jingle the keys. So while I was giving this talk, I heard the keys jingling a little bit. He, he was 
And I was like, oh, there's Eric. He's sitting in the back of the room and he was just kind of had a big smile on his face and uh, jingling the keys. And uh, what he was having me present to them was to, I had several things to say. One was we, you know, we all came here being individual artists and now we have to, and we all had our own style, but now we all have to blend and match. So we get rid of some of our differences as artists uh, as we're trying to sort of homogenize an approach, which sometimes that's a bad principle. But, you know, when you're working together as a team on a film, you got to match styles. You don't want people shot by shot to go like, oh, who animated that? Oh, somebody else animated that. I mean, they shouldn't think about that. They should just feel the characters are who, who they need to be from artist to artist. As you pass the baton, it looks looks the same. But I was cautioning us that as we're sort of getting rid of some of our individual styles as artists and we're finding this blending middle spot to make sure that we don't do that with the characters personalities because they each have to remain vividly themselves who they are so you know yeah, it's like todd and copper and trixie and all these the vixie they should all have their own way of moving and expressing and be who they are uh, and not we shouldn't homogenize them in terms of their personality profile they, they need to remain distinctly one of a kind. And as we search for ways to express it in the birds, I was showing them that here are some things that I have discovered. And I've been told that some of these things are too cartoony to be in a feature. I went ahead and, and went all the way to bluntly saying this to the, the room full of, of my fellow animators. And I said, I'm now going to show you some nature footage that I got out of the Disney library and they, you know, from the Vanishing Prairie and the Living Desert and on and on, they, I, I had them look through for bird footage. So I put live action bird footage on the movie screen and I stepped through frames and sure enough, a real bird with real feathers and a real camera when it's gonna take off would be in a pose and then the next frame would be like slightly different and then the third frame stretch of color and look like 12 wings and then boom, it was gone. It was like, okay, I'm being told that that's too cartoony, but it's a real bird and a real camera. So it is not too cartoony. That is life. And in animation, we're trying to caricature life. So in a way, you should find out a way to go even further than that. But that's I'm being told that that real bird is too cartoony. It is not. It is life. So uh, I was encouraging people to be bold, to try. In our case, we had to keep it under wraps and hidden as a process, but it was really remarkable to have the veteran in that case, the nine old, one of the nine old men in league with us, in league with me, encouraging me even in the deception because he knew it was to protect something creatively sound and something creatively that the director signed off on. It's just hide the, if the process is tripping them up, hide the process from them because they already fell in love with the character's performance on the screen. You are giving them that. So he approved hiding the, the, the process from them so that they could continue to enjoy the results. And, and I went ahead and, and uh, encouraged other people to find discoveries in their work and to find some way, even if they had to hide the process, if the directors liked the result, protect the result by just doing whatever you have to do to, to get it in front of them in movement, because that's where it lives. And uh, if they approve that, then protect the process to get it to happen. So uh, that was part of the process. So we had already failed with doing the dramatic opening with uh, you know, showing that the, the baby fox was indeed an orphan. Um, but I was trying to protect at least part of trying something new and uh, something adventurous with the, with the birds in it. So it did work. And even though I did a lot of other things and I just, somebody sent me recently a production draft where it lists every shot in the entire film. And so I was able to go through and I have 56 scenes in the in the feature and some it's the hunter and Big Mama and Todd and Boomer and Dinky. And so, the, the, you know, this all manner of different characters that I did, but I did do quite a bit of the bird animation. But also when Brad Bird would animate, he was following that same movement palette that I had established and John Musker did the same. So they, uh, you know, they really embraced it. The one animator that did not was Cliff Nordberg. He 
it just had his own way to work and he so he never looked at any of my stuff or tried to emulate it he just just did his own thing so occasionally when you see dinker be completely a different bird it was that was cliff yes so uh but anyway so that that was quite a process and we felt like the and in fact it's interesting in the vanity fair article about the it's called the class that roared about the a113 classic cal arts in that article a number of us are quoted and brad mentions seeing me struggling with trying to fight against rotoscope and uh in the vanity fair article i i actually excerpted that for a, a presentation deck i had uh where i used brad's quote where he said you know jerry reese was working on a scene of the hunter and it had so much character and then they kept having him redo it and redo it and tone it down and tone it down and tone it down until it was like nowhere near the the sparkle that it started with and he said he was and brad said you know jerry didn't want them to didn't want to give them what they were looking for because they were looking for something that wasn't very good you know he's like he was trying to protect the quality so uh his memory of that time was himself going through it and watching me go through these struggles where you start with something that's that has a sparkle and a creative statement and then is being watered down and watered down and watered down and um so in many different ways in like big storytelling arcs like do we commit to the baby being an orphan and the mother having been killed by the the hunters like the big picture like that or like do you caricature animation or just trace live action and you know how how far can you go with individual drawings when you're animating a bird it's like in every case big picture and moderate and small details there was this push towards homogenizing and taking any extremes away and uh, we felt like the one aspect that really did survive and we've talked about it, uh, those of us that worked on the film together, and there's generally an agreement that the reason it survived was just raw schedule was Glenn Keane's bear fight sequence. Uh, they were just running out of time on the film. And I think we all felt like if the film schedule had been maybe six months longer, that they would have gone through and like toned down and toned down and toned down the bear fight too. And maybe rotoscoped a real bear or something, you know, just this way. So, uh, but they felt like we all felt like because we were getting close to the end of the production schedule and they had to finish that, that was a good thing for Glenn's sequence. It, it got protected and John Musker did uh, the scenes with the, the hunter that as he confronted the, the bear and between the two of them, they really wound up with a sequence that was, that did have much more the kind of commitment to storytelling and drama that we were hoping to do with the whole film. And, and I, I don't know if you re knew this, but I, as, as soon as I finished my animation schedule, I jumped on to clean up for the bear fight sequence to help protect Glenn's animation. Cause we, you know, we were so loved it so much that those of us who were animators wanted to make sure that that an animator's mind was grappling with how to clean up those thick lines that he would do. And, um, you know, th that could be interpreted so many different ways. So I'd always be sort of rolling through the drawings, looking for, you know, where the, where the forces were being exerted during a, a moment. And for that thick line, should I favor the inside of the line for this moment or the middle of the line or the outside of the line to, to best achieve the forces at work? And so I was, had my animator's hat on rolling through the action before I would do the cleanup drawings. And uh, so for so for a while, I was I, I joined the cleanup team to finish that picture off. So, so that that animation you mentioned about you uh, doing the hunter with that that walk. Do you remember what what moment that was, or could that have been anything? Ah, uh, gosh, there's I, I have the draft here, and it mentions a number of scenes with the hunter, uh, including him walking, carrying wood, uh, observing the. The woman when she's taking the driving the fox away and returning and he's spying on her and things when he's in the cabin with uh with chief later and also when he's driving and trying to shoot and stuff so i think some of that i was not tied to rotoscope but i i think 
Brad was probably talking about one of the, it seemed like he was describing a walking scene and, you know, they often did for a lot of it just gave us straight rotoscope and there was a, you know, I was so glad that with, with some of those things, I was able to avoid it and uh, just animate. And I loved animating. And I, you know, when I was, whenever I was dealing with humans, I felt very inspired by the work, work that Milt Call had done. And I, I liked the way he drew hands and was trying to learn how to break hand gestures down uh, in a way that was inspired by Milt. So I, I just loved animating humans. And I, I didn't, I hated the crutch of trying to just trace what somebody did because it's like, you know, that person is not a brilliant actor. I mean, you're, it's not like they're hiring Meryl Streep to do this stuff. A lot of times it would just be, hey, would you put on a costume and walk around? And they just have, it's like very much B actor kind of stuff. Um, and so having that as reference is okay, but to literally be forced more and more to trace uh, is just to to water down the effect of the of the animation entirely. And that you know, in the old days, they did a lot of in some of the classic days, they did a lot of live action reference, but it was not a slavish rotoscope tracing at all. There was a, a wonderful expressiveness. And, you know, you look at something that is a beautiful mix of feeling uh, tied to real human anatomy and, and movement, but being vitally its, itself and, and not tied to any sort of rotoscope would be like Brom Bones in Ichabod, uh, you know, when he's, uh, singing the the song uh you know about the headless horseman and just that was milk call and i'm sure he looked at some reference but that did not feel an ounce of rotoscope going on that felt so animated and expressive so you know that's what i was all of us were trying to do that uh, is be inspired by it and base base certain things on it um uh, but to exaggerate and push and especially in emotional terms and cinematic dramatic terms and so that was a frustrating thing uh but yeah brad's description was of a walk scene and i i think it was i'd have to go back and refresh my memory on it but i i remember one of the scenes listed in the draft was i had it was me animating him walking outside his house uh sort of spying on the woman and the you know she's taking the fox to the to the game preserve I, I I guess the big the big question is uh, in regards to uh, Chief and letting him live, and I know that kind of affected a lot of character motivations, a lot of how the hunter, how we view the hunter, because Chief was as I'm sure you remember supposed to get hit by the train and die, and that inspires the vengeance in not only the hunter but in Copper, and when Chief just breaks his leg, as it ended up being it. It, it makes them come off as a little more petty. Well, I, I agree with you. And, and you know, I go back to the mother where you'd say, now it makes a big difference how you think about the mom if she was killed by a hunter and it's an orphan rather than, well, she protected the baby, but she lived, but she never went back for it. She just, uh, she just decided, well, I got away from the hunters and I hope the baby's doing okay, but uh, I'm just going to go on with my life and, not go back it makes it makes a big difference and you know i feel like with the mom they should have committed to she died and it's an orphan and and i agree with you with the you know the chief and the motivation for hunter and for copper that yes it would have been stronger and in all those cases they they really avoided in big and small terms the the more dramatic choices i know um, that the, the movie was in production <clears throat> for a while do you know how late a decision it was to let chief live I, I'm not sure. I just know that at, it seemed like as they were crafting the film, you know, they were doing the sort of the safe choice uh, as much as possible. So, I, you know, I, I think that decision could have been made by Art and Ted quite early. And, and it's just, you know, those of us who were, you know, the, coming in with the younger generation and the, the veterans that were teaching us, we were all trying to coax things towards something more dramatic, but it wasn't like they were on a dramatic track and then got scared later and toned it down. They would ask, they would hand out scenes and start sequences. They were starting with the play it safe uh, draft right away. Uh, they didn't try something dramatic and then tone it down. They would say, do it watered down to beginning, begin with. Like, this is how we're gonna do it at the beginning and have a little drama, but not too much. And 
She's in trouble, but she's not killed. Maybe she's killed, maybe she's not, but don't commit, leave question. And it's, it's a shame that, that uh, you know, they didn't have the trust in their own audience and in their own legacy to go with the same commitment that they had for the classics, you know? It was an interesting thing. I was breaking this down with, uh, with a couple other people over the last couple of years. I think we started finding more time to talk about these things during the pandemic when everything was kind of shut down. And we started having more lengthy discussions about, about all kinds of things in our histories. And this era had come up and it just, it really became apparent in discussing this that the sort of toning down the dimming of emotion and commitment and uh, even like not doing too extreme a camera angle, but doing more of an average camera angle and stuff like that didn't sort of accidentally happen. They didn't sort of wander into this kind of watered down zone. That's like when we were, when Brad and I went in to visit uh, Frank and Ollie, it's like they were wanting to do the dramatic thing. And they didn't like wander into sort of milk toast land. They were like, here's some drama. And their director was going, no, I won't allow it. We're going to do the soft thing. And so it was a, a decision that was made to play it safe. Like that, that was a decision. It wasn't just a, they lost their way. It was a decision. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing with Fox and the Hound, this stuck out to me as a kid. It sticks out to me now. Uh, the, the one place where I think you guys didn't play it safe was the ending. Cause I, I found some early storyboard ideas for the movie. Like I think really pre-production stuff that where it had a, appeared to have an unambiguously happy ending where everyone gets to stay friends and in the final movie, they, they really don't. I mean, they do in spirit, but there's this underlying feeling of sadness. And I'm kind of, it didn't really sit right with me as a kid. And I it still makes me feel pretty sad now, but it's a really interesting choice. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's good that there were some consequences and you don't feel like just everything is always hunky-dory. And uh, it, it may be that after the power of the bear fight sequence, which as I was saying, I think that was protected, the intention for it was protected because of running out of time. And so they couldn't mess with it. It's like they, they didn't have time to water it down. Uh, I think that helped set a tone for something quite dramatic to set up where the ending would go. And so uh, I'm sure that helped the ending sit a little better with it being a, a little less rosy ending because they, they had gone through such a harrowing experience. Uh, but if it had been, the additional thing had been, the, you know, the death of Chief, it would have played sort of more appropriately than it does now. But uh, we always wondered what it would have been like with a full commitment uh, and the same commitment that the veterans had and that the young people had, if that was, if, if the bear fight sequence was not an unusual part, but was typical of a whole film that was really committed to an approach, what that film might have been. When The Black Cauldron started, we, when we had first seen Mel Shaw's inspiration concept art for the film, it seemed like it could be that breakthrough thing that was akin to the kind of cinema that Star Wars brought in. And then when we went through the process of the Fox and the Hound, so the, you know, the, the Black Cauldron artwork was up there. It's like, that's a future film. It's like, we're, we're going to go there. But as we're toiling through the Fox and the Hound, getting closer to starting on the Black Cauldron, we could see like, oh, they're, they're going to water that down too. They're just, it's, they're, it's, the fates are not on its side. So we went, if it, if it lived up to what, Mel Shaw's concept art was, and if they had let the veterans and the young people who were on the same page, like make a committed film with the Fox and the Hound, I think that would have set the Black Cauldron up to be a dynamic piece of, of cinema history. Um, but as it was, there were a lot of us that realized that we weren't going to stay to help the, with the Black Cauldron since it was going through the same fate of uh, being watered down and, and not living up to that concept art and playing it safe, even though it was an inherently dramatic concept. It's like, how do you, you like try to be really careful and not get too dramatic with something that's inherently dramatic is, uh, you know, 
not not a, a happy task. The artwork was on the wall, but the writing was on the wall too. <laughs> yeah, you well put, my friend. And then, so we felt like, okay, with Gary Kurtz, understanding what we were up to and backing our efforts to try to do an innovative feature film with Will Eisner's The Spirit adapted into an animated feature. We felt like, okay, that that is a, has a much better shot at actually coming out as the disruptive creative piece that we want than what the Black Cauldron would would become under the forces that we saw at work during that era. So, and, and we were certainly right not to, not to stick around and take that gamble. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, you know, Gary Kurtz was not able to support us getting it off the ground. So the world had to wait quite a few years for something like that to come along. I felt like when Brad finally was able to make the Incredibles, uh, you know, that was very much the, the tone of filmmaking that we were ready to do back in like in 1982, 83. It could have been great, but I'm glad The Incredibles was also great. Yes, it, we just could have had even more films that were in, of that ilk. Now that is the end of the Fox and the Hound section, but there's actually a second section we recorded, and that was about the Brave Little Toaster, which he directed. The Brave Little Toaster is an interesting case because you can make an argument that it is not a Disney movie, but you can also make an argument that it is a Disney movie. It's sort of just on the edge of being a Disney movie, and it is a really, it's a very important movie to me. I mean, honestly, I met my wife because of our shared love of this movie, so I am going to sort of fudge my rules and do a video on the villains in the Brave Little Toaster for that reason, because, well, quite frankly, it's my series. <laughs> Oh, and one more thing before I go, uh, Jerry and I have been having some uh, email correspondence, of course. And after I posted the initial video, he sent me one thing that I don't think he'd mind if I shared. Just a little bit of relevant information about his work on Tron. And he says, uh, your Tron segment brought back a lot of memories, too. I did production storyboards before becoming one of the two computer image choreographers for the film, me and Bill Croyer. The facets of the MCP's face and his mouth shapes were all hand-drawn by me with a ruler before being wrapped onto the cylindrical shape. I also choreographed scenes with the Cycles, the Recognizers, and Solar Sailors. It was a real adventure at the time, especially following the restraints that I'd encountered on animating The Fox and the Hound. This time, we were invited to be innovative. So you will hear the rest of the interview when I cover Toaster, which should be, uh, I'm going to guess, next year or so. Until then, thank you so much for listening.